If you would stand with me and turn your Bibles once again to Psalm 103. Terry Ann, please shut that other door, please. Thank you. We'll be in the book of Psalms, and we'll be in Psalm 103 once again tonight. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 11. The scripture says there in Psalm 103, beginning in verse 11, it says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far that he removed our transgression from us. Like a, as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame and remembereth that we are dust. As for a man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto, the child, unto, unto children's children." To such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments, to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, and ye ministers of his, to do, that do his pleasure." Bless the Lord in all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you again tonight. We thank you for another opportunity to be able just to gather here and to worship you. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to move in our midst as we get to the preaching of your word. I ask, Lord, you'd hide me behind the cross once again, and I ask again for a fresh anointing of the unction of the Holy Spirit to preach your word this evening with conviction. I pray, Lord Jesus, that as your word goes forth, that it would find the lost within the sound of my voice and bring conviction to their lives. Draw them unto yourself. Show them their need to turn to you and trust in you and be gloriously saved. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts that are already saved. Lord Jesus, that we would see the need to be thankful, that we would lift you up and be uh, praising you because of how faithful you've been to us. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would just move and speak to us and may we be hearers and doers of your word here this evening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The power of thankfulness. This morning we looked at the first 10 verses of Psalm 103 and we see it as a Psalm of David where David, we understood, um, experienced the Lord in so many different circumstances and experiences that I think he learned to grow and to know what it means to be thankful. And I think sometimes, especially in our culture today, that the attitude of thankfulness um, is something actually we have to work for. I think it's something that we have to really contemplate upon. Because for whatever reason, we live in a day and we live in a time and we live in a culture that feels as if we are entitled, that feels as if we are deserving of whatever and everything. And a lot of times we aren't as thankful as we need to be and should be, even over the most small things that we might take for granted, you know? We think about the fact that we have the opportunity to get up this morning to freely come to a place of worship with no fears, no concerns of that. And so many times, instead of being thankful and taking advantage of that, we just go about life and do what we want because we freely can. And sometimes we put the Lord first and sometimes we do not. There's other things I think in life that we may not always take for granted, you know. I mean, not always are thankful for them because we do take for granted is what I meant to say. Maybe it is whether it's just the ability to get us something to eat when we want it, or maybe to be able to um, be around our friends and our family when we want to. Um, just all of the different things that we have 
and that we are blessed with. And I think sometimes we forget that the scripture teaches us that every good gift comes down from our Father of lights. And so when we think about the, the, the power of thankfulness, as we get into the season of Thanksgiving, and if it's just right around the corner this coming Thursday, I think there's so much for us to be thankful for. And I think that just the first 10 verses that we looked at this morning, we've seen several things that uh, cause us to, and should cause us to be thankful. We think that we should be thankful in verse 2 for all of the Lord's benefits. You know, when a person gets saved, they don't just receive forgiveness. You know, so many times, that's what people say, man, I, I want to be forgiven. Well, the, the neat thing about the Lord Jesus is though he's a forgiving God, salvation is so much more than simply just forgiveness. It's more than just being pardoned of your sin, or it's more than just having your sins wiped away, but then you start thinking about all the other benefits that go along with that. The fact that he... In, in, he imputes unto us his righteousness. He adopts us into his family. He translates us out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. That we have now a home in heaven. We know that our inheritance is reserved for us in a place where the robber can't get to, where the rust can't get to, where nothing can affect our eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus, in the here and now, we have access to the throne of God, that we can come before our Heavenly Father with boldness. When we have need, when we have concern, when we have trouble, when we just want to commune with Him, we can come before the throne of grace with boldness. You know, not think about the access that we have to God. I mean, that in of itself is something for us to, to, to really be thankful for. And I know there's a lot of misconceptions out there in the world that think that anybody and everybody has access to the throne of God. I said, well, God will hear anybody's prayer. No, it doesn't exactly work like that, folks. The very first prayer that God hears from somebody where he is taking attention to and responding to is that when a sinner repents of their sin and cries out for mercy and grace. But after you trust in Jesus and you become part of the family, so to speak, and you've been covered in his blood, now you have access to his throne, to his presence, to the, through the, the person of the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, there's power in that. And there's such a, you know, it's just like going home. You know, I remember when my, my mom and my grandpa, my brothers and sisters, they moved out of the apartment that I grew up in. I never did live in the house that they, that, uh, they lived in uh, after that. I never lived there. I moved out. And uh, I was gone, and then they moved into a house. But when they moved to that house, um, I went up there one day and I didn't have a key to get in. I said, now, this ain't happening long. I don't live here. I get that. I've never slept here. I get that. But uh, I'm, I, if this is where y'all live, this is my house. So I get a key to the house, and they got me a key to the house. You know, and when I went up there, I show up. I want to come. I mean, I might be courteous and tell my mom I'm, coming up or something like that but you know at the same time you know I'm going to go home I go home I'm not going to feel like I ain't at home I don't care where it is my mom and my grandpa and my brothers and sisters are there that's my home you know and that's where I was going to go well guess what when a person gets saved they have access to the very presence of God you don't have to feel like a visitor no you have the privilege of going to be in the presence of the Lord. There's so many benefits of being a child of God. And because of those benefits, we should be thankful. He goes on to say this also in verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquity. And I think about uh, some of the benefits and the things that we can be thankful for. What about the fact that he forgives all of our iniquities? When Jesus died on the cross, you know what all of your sin was future because you didn't even physically exist yet. And when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he shed his blood and gave his life to pay for all of your sin. Every bit of it was took care of on the cross of Calvary. And when you trust in him, all your iniquity is forgiven. 
I mean, that's amazing, folks. That is awesome to think about that when God looks at us, he looks at us through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he looks at us. All of our sins have been forgiven. All of our iniquities have been forgiven. He also has the, the ability to heal all thy diseases. And we live in a world with everything going on and this pandemic that we've been in and the fears of sickness and the fears of death and, and, and the hanging on to the idea of self-preservation here as if we just keep, you know, we're not careful, this is going to happen, this thing, this is going to happen. What I understand is this, we serve a God who's bigger than all the diseases. You know what I read in the scripture in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if we really want to see, see something take place in our nation, if we want to see this thing wrapped up, if we want to see the, the pestilence uh, uh, subside, if we want to see the pandemic quit, God's people who are called by his name need to turn from their wicked ways, need to repent, and need to call on him, and then he will hear, and then he will heal the land. He can bring about healing of all manner of diseases. And we serve a God that, you know what? Maybe man and, and the physicians of, of this world, they don't have all answers. But we know the great physician. Tell me what, what disease Jesus couldn't heal when he showed up. What disease was it? Was it the leper that came to Jesus and could not receive any type of healing? No. In fact, the leper knew perfectly, if you would, if you would, if you will, you could touch and make me whole. Jesus said, I will touch him and made him whole. Nobody could cure leprosy of that day. All they could do was put those folks in quarantine. They ain't quarantine the well people. They quarantine the sick people. But to put them in quarantine, they covered their faces up, and they told them to say, unclean, unclean. But when Jesus showed up, guess what he did to the unclean? He made them clean. What about the blinded eye? Even today, when your eye start, starts going, there is no return of that. Guess what God can do? Touch the blinded eye and cause it to see. The deaf ear, cause it to hear. The lame to walk. The dead to rise. We serve a God who is able to touch and to heal all manner of diseases. Man, we got much to be thankful for. When we get the bad news at a doctor, you know what? If you're saved, you're a winner either way. But coming before his throne of grace is not in vain. We don't talk to God and pray and have a uh, prayer chain started and have prayer meetings and, and begin to join together for no reason. We don't go through the motion just because of going through the motion. Folks, we gather together and talk to God and seek his face because we know he can do what we cannot do. He can heal all manner of diseases. And so much to be thankful for, you know. He goes on to say here, he redeemed our life from destruction in verse 4. Think about that. Every single person in here, except for the grace of God, would end up in a life of destruction. I mean, tell me somebody, this, people got it all together. You know what I've learned over the years? People do a good job of appearing to have it together. But that's about it. Most of us don't have it together. Most of us, except for God's mercy and God's grace, are on a path of destruction. One mishap, one poor choice, one slip up here or there, and your life is completely destroyed, irreparable. You can't undo it. You can't fix it. I think about um, uh, uh, the NFL player just the other day. I think Henry Ruggs is his name, played for the Las Vegas Raiders, no longer playing for them, but I think he had a little too much to drink, and he was over there driving over 100, and I can't even remember now, 15 mile an hour or something. It's crazy speed. Hit somebody, he don't die, but kills other people. Everything right there in that guy's hands. One poor choice, done. One poor choice, done. You know? Did he intend to do that? No. Is that guy a whole horrible person because he did that? Well, he don't need to be drinking in the first place. Sure, don't need to be drinking and driving. He probably don't need to be going 100-something mile an hour. But is that guy a completely horrible person because of that? No. I don't think so. You can hear the screams on the video of him crying. You know what happened? Guarantee it. Flashing through his mind, he became sober pretty quick. 
what in the world have I done? What have I done? Can he undo it? No, he cannot. He cannot undo it. You can't bring those people back to life. You can't undo the fact that you were drunk. You can't undo the fact that you were driving 115 mile an hour. And you can't undo the fact that you have destroyed your life. Let me tell you something, folks. There ain't one person in this room, ain't one person listening by radio or one person watching on Facebook that all it takes is one mishap and your life's destroyed. Ain't nobody above that. Ain't nobody above that. But we serve a God who is, has stability and wants to redeem our life from destruction. Not just here in the physical life, but the Bible plainly teaches that those who are not saved are on a broad path that leads to destruction. Jesus went to the old rugged cross to purchase our messed up life to deliver us from destruction. Folks, we got much to be thankful for tonight. He goes on to say that not only did he redeem our life from destruction, but he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercy. You know, I, I think about how that what we deserve is the punishment of Almighty God. That's what we deserve. We deserve a place in the lake of fire. We deserve his judgment. We deserve his wrath. But what's he want to do to us? He wants to crown us with his loving kindness. He wants to crown us with his tender mercies. When I think about, you know, gr uh, Thanksgiving, and I think about, you know, just, just the idea of being thankful. Man, there's power in that. There's power in the fact that God, his grace, his mercy sustained us from a life of destruction, but instead gives us loving kindness and tender mercy. How that should change our lives. You know, how it should change our lives. Not we should be taking that stuff for granted. Not that we're entitled. If we understood what the scripture said and we really was uh, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to, we should understand that thankfulness should come about because our life is changed and therefore we should begin to act different in our life towards him and towards others. He goes on in this passage as we move through quickly because we talked about this morning, but he says, who satisfies thy mouth with good things. You know, we ought to be thankful because God is a God who satisfies the longing of our hearts. You know, I say this, and I, I mean this. The, more, the older I get, the more I grow in the Lord, the more that the things of this world, I don't care nothing about them. I really don't. You got to have certain things to live. I get that. But I don't care about all this stuff, you know? You know, I, I watched my kids, Aiden's one of them. He, you know, he's, he's kind of looking at everything. You know, he's, he knows what the styles are today. I don't know. I mean, he's, you know, he knows what the, he cares. You know, he cares. I don't even care about that no more. I mean, at one time, I probably, I cared about it. Everybody has what they like. Everybody has their little styles. Everybody has their little niche, whatever it may be, and things that they, at one time, I, I don't even care anymore. I don't care nothing about you. Say, well, you're just getting old fuddy duh. Well, that might be true, too. But the older I get, the more I realize that I don't care nothing about this. If you hang on long enough, your style that went out, you can hang on that style. You know why? Because it's going to come around again. I promise you it will. I mean, if a mullet can come back, anything can come back. Hello? Are you with me? I mean, it come back. Hello? I mean, I hope it don't hang around too long. But these young people think that a mullet's a good thing again. You know, it's coming back. So, it's here, it's gone, it changes, it's, you know, these things of this world, but what I've learned is that guess what? The things of this world can't ever satisfy really the longing of your heart for any amount of time. For a short season it will, but then it's gone and you have to figure something else out. But the Lord satisfies our mouth with good things. He also, uh, it says there that thy youth is renewed like the eagle's. Have you ever just been to a place that you just wore out and you just want to quit? You just want to throw in the towel? You just want to, you just want to give up? God says that he will renew your strength. He says it also in the book of Isaiah that when we grow weary, you know what he will do? He will renew our strength just like the wings of eagles so we could take flight. Folks, when we're living for Christ, we, we can be satisfied. We can be renewed. We have the word. Think of verse 7. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. 
Folks, we serve a God who didn't leave us in the dark. We might live in a dark world, but we've got the light of the Word of God to guide us and direct us. We serve an all-knowing, all-wise, with a great purpose God, and He has given us His book. When David wrote this, you have the first five books of Moses, and you had some of the prophets coming along, but let me tell you, he didn't have the complete revelation like you and I have. How blessed we are to have from Genesis to Revelation, the inspired and errant infallible Word of God. Uh, everybody wants to know where we come from. Well, just flip open your Bible to Genesis and you begin to see what's going on. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Well, just flip to the end of the story and read the book of Revelation and it began to show you. When you see everything going on around us in this world and it seems so distressing and, and you get all tore up about it you just can't imagine it and everything's happening hey <laughs> if you read the book you wouldn't be caught off by surprise folks you would know what's going on you would see you would see this happening you'd say you know what man the bible talks about things like this the bible describes things like this i mean you read revelation chapter 6 and you start seeing the seals unloosed, guess what? Antichrist rises to the scene. The spirit of Antichrist, according to 1 John, is already here, been here. But Antichrist is going to rise to the scene, and guess what he's going to do? He's going to conquer this world without even firing a shot. He's going to be riding on a white horse that describes him as. He's going to have a bow in his hand, but he's not going to have any arrows in his quiver. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to go about in this world, and the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, he is going to pretty much conquer the world as they look to him for answers. You know why they're going to be looking to him? Because famine's going to be coming. Death's going to be coming. Pestilence is going to be coming. There's going to be a lot of stuff happening in this world not with a few folks, and they won't have to worry about um, uh, tweaking the numbers. Folks, there's going to be a third of the population going to die. Just like that. Just like that. Wild animals going to be attacking. I mean, read Revelation chapter 6. When you start seeing something like the coronavirus pandemic, and you start seeing these high crazy prices, everybody's scrambling to get a Thanksgiving turkey because this went from, you know, 88 cents a pound to... $3 a pound, some places. I mean, you think about everything. I mean, it's crazy. I was hundreds of percent increase. Uh, my father-in-law bought 88 cents a pound in Walmart and over there in M Middlesbrough. I said, go check, see what they cost there. He did. Got us a big turkey. I came over here to this one. It's $1.88 a pound. I mean, that's a big increase, you know, for a turkey. I mean, it's all right, but come on, folks. I'd rather have something like you know, prime rib or something. But I, I can't get that right now. But think about what's going on in the world. The Word of God has given. We got much to be thankful for. He says in verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Some will be saying, if God is so good, why is he allowing this to go on? Why doesn't he put a stop to it? Because God is slow to anger. And he has plenteous and mercy. He desires all people to be saved. But let's remember, folks, we serve a God who created man in his image. And part, a part of that is he made us free moral beings. Now, some would say, why did he ever create man? I don't have all the answers to some of this question. But he is an all-wise God who makes perfect decisions. And he is slow in his anger and plenteous in his mercy because he desires people to come to know him. Folks, that's much to be thankful for right there. That's, that's enough because if it wasn't that way, you and I would die and go to hell. But it goes on to say then, there in verse 9, he will not always chide, neither will he, will he keep his anger forever. Even when he begins to judge, that will not happen forever. And then, as we already read in verse 11, it says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And it says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions 
from our sin or from us. Think about that, folks. As we move on in Psalm 103 and see the last half of the psalm, does God, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with something in your life that you've repented of, and that comes back and you feel condemned and you, you think, man, I'm not worthy, and you think, I mean, what kind of person am I, and you can't get past it, is that God who keeps bringing that up? It's not. How do we know that? Because it says right here that he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. And what that means is he never remembers it. He's done away with it. I mean, if you go east, you're never going to get west. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, turn around and go the other direction. And that's what he's saying. He has removed our transgressions from us. And so when, when Satan tries to remind you what you were and what you was and all that, that stuff in the past, like some old preacher said before, just remind him of his future. Because it ain't God bringing the condemnation, folks. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And so all you have to do is remind him that, hey, I've been washed in the blood. Hey, I'm a child of God. What sin are you talking about? If God sure don't remember, I'm not going to remember it. Hello? And if God's done away with our sin and we're not going to hang out in that sin anymore and we've moved on from it, God's done forgiving it, he's done forgot about it, he's not like us, folks. We'll tell somebody we forgive them every time we get a chance, we'll hold up over their head. That ain't forgiveness. God don't do that. He said, well, we can't be like God. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to strive to be. I'm thankful tonight that he does away with our sin as far as the east is from the west. I'm also thankful tonight that he is like a perfect father. You know, there's times I tell my kids, hey, listen, you know I'm not perfect. But I hope my imperfections don't mess up your idea about who God is. God is perfect in all his ways. You might want to grow up and be mad at me sometimes. I get that. But you can't never grow up and be mad at God because God ain't bad. God's good. And he says, just like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Think about that. God inspired David to write about the fact that God cares about those who fear him or trust in him who have been saved he cares about them like a father does his children. You know what? I love my kids. I discipline my kids when it's necessary. But man, I don't, I don't want nothing bad for them. I want what's good for them. I want what's best for them. I want them to have everything that they can have and need in this life. And I'm not just talking about just to throw stuff at them. When I see them struggle, that bothers me, no matter what it is. When I see them go through hard times, that bothers me. You know what is awesome? The one true and living God of the universe, the creator of the heaven and the earth, the one who's always been, the one who formed us from the dust of the earth, the one who's still active and making us in the womb of our mother today, he cares about us way more than we could ever care for our own kids. It's amazing. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Folks, he cares about us. That, that's, that's just an awesome thought. Look, look what else it is. We ought to be thankful that God knows us. Look, for he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. That means... He understands our limitations. Do you know that God's not sitting up there in heaven thinking, why are these people just like the Father? Well, the Father is not thinking, looking at us, saying, why aren't these people just like Jesus was? You know why? Because he already knows. Did Jesus become 100% human? Yes, he did. But he is 100% God in the flesh. So did he deal with humanity-type things? Yes, he got tired, he got hungry, so on and so forth. 
Was he tempted and always like it unto man? Yes, but he never did sin. He's 100% God at the same time as he was 100% man. He did not inherit a sin nature. He was conceived miraculously. He was born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit of God overshadowed Mary, placed him in the womb of Mary. So there's no sin nature that Jesus had to deal with. He's God in the flesh. He's 100% God, 100% man, 100% without sin. He was tempted, but he never did sin himself. He took on our sin. He endured the wrath of God because of our sin. He died because of our sin. He rose again, overcoming our sin. Guess what God knows? God knows every bit of your limitations. You know that it's, it, it is such a thing of, that we can be grateful for to understand that God has a standard, but he does not expect us to meet it on our own. The grace of God is there. The mercy of God is there. The Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, comes inside of our life when we trust in Him. The Word of God is there to teach us and to guide us and direct us. When we fail, guess what? We confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us of all our sin. He writes these things so we don't sin, but if we do sin, we have an advocate, the Lord Jesus. He's our defense attorney. Amen? I'm thankful for that today. You know? And I'm thankful that that when Satan, as we see in the book of Zechariah, when Satan tries to go and accuse the brethren, you know, he tried to accuse Joshua, the high priest, constantly. There's Joshua standing there in dirty clothes, dirty garments, and Satan's over here. Look at this guy. He's dirty. He's dirty. Jesus just goes over and says, what are you talking about? Gives him a new garment, clean. He defends us. He stands up for us. Why? Because he's the one that took our place. Ain't no, double, ain't no double jeopardy, folks. Jesus already took our sin. We were declared guilty, and he took our sin, and he died in our place, but he overcome it. And when someone dies of sin, sin no longer has dominion on them. And Jesus resurrected from the dead. So he cast our sin as far as east is from the west. He pities us as a father does his children. And he understands our frame. He understands the fact and remembers that we're just dust. Now, don't, that's not an excuse. You know, we'll say things like this. Well, we're just human. That's, that's true. But that's not an excuse. Because God remembers that we are our frame. He remembers that we're just dust. But he is the one that comes to enable us to live in a way that's pleasing to him. I think we also can understand that though we are frail, God's eternal, and that's something for us to be thankful for. Verse 16 says, the wind passes over it, and it's gone, or back 15 rather, for man in his days are as the grass, and as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. And for the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. This is the facts. This is how we are. James says we're like a vapor. We're here for a little while and then we're gone. Ecclesiastes says the same thing as this passage here. We're, we're just like the flower. We're just like the grass. We're here for a minute and then we're gone. And you know what? People forget about us. But he goes on to say, though, he says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him his righteousness unto children's children. What's John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him would not perish but have everlasting life. Man, well, we're so temporary. Our life, just a drop in a bucket. Here today, gone tomorrow. You have no promise of long life. And even if you have what we consider long life, it's very short in the grand scheme of what eternity is. But when you trust in Jesus, the Bible teaches us in John chapter 11, he said, Jesus said of himself, I'm the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he dead, yet shall he live. And those that live in me, or live and believe in me, shall never die. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. When I think about this, we're in the frailty of life here, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, how much could we endure of this old messed up world? Really. 
when you know Christ and you die and leave this place and you go to be with him and, and one day you're going to receive glorified body, one day you're going to be reunited with all those who've gone on to be with Jesus, whether they went before you or they come after you, one day there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. There's going to be no sin. There's going to be no Satan. There's going to be no effects of either one of those. And we will live in eternal perfection with never seeing an end to that day. There's never going to be a nighttime. There's never going to be a fallback. I mean, does this time of the year not mess you up? I come into church, it's 6 o'clock. I think, man, why we have, what's wash night service for? It ain't, it ain't New Year's Eve yet, but that's what it feels like. One day in heaven, guess what? Lights ain't going out. Not because of the S-U-N, but because the glory of the S-O-N is going to shine for all eternity. Man, we got a lot to be thankful for. He says in verse 18, to such as keep his covenant, to those that remember his commandments, to do them. You know, when we think about what God, those that are saved receive these benefits, these blessings. He says in verse 18, to such as, as the, or, or verse 19, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Hey, let me tell you something. At, at this time of the year, so we're going to November, you know, we've already had some election take place. You're going to have some, uh, not much, but you have some. And it already passed, rather. Next year, there's going to be some more. It's going to be a lot more. And you know what they're going to be, they're going to be talking about? Who's in control? Who's, who's got the House? Who's got the Senate? Who's going to be in the White House? And that's not next year. I wish it was, but it was, it's not. But eventually, everybody's going to be out. Who's going to be there? Who's going to be there? Who's in control? All these types of things. You know what, folks? You know what we know what's going on right now? Right now, David wrote way back. He said, plainly, the Lord's prepared his throne. His throne's in the heaven. His kingdom rules over all. His kingdom's over all. I'm not sweating all this foolishness. He raises up the kings, he brings them down. He raises up the nations, he brings them down. Folks, he's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. Does that mean that we're not concerned about anything going on? No, but when things go beyond our control, does that mean that we should be fretting? Does that mean we should be so distressed? Does that mean we should be so tore up? Does that mean we should be so burdened down? Does that mean we should seem as if there's no hope? No, we serve a God who is eternally in control. He's, so he's sovereign, 100% sovereign. And then we also ought to be thankful that he's Lord of over all things, not just like the governments. Look what he says, the angels. Bless the Lord. The angels are to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, all the ministers of his, to do his pleasure. Then all the works. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Angelic host. He's creator of all things. You know, when I, when I think, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, when we think about who recognizes God as God, it's not just even, it's not just the angels in heaven. When Jesus showed up, demons knew who he was. Je demons fell subject to him. When I think about the Lord, man, he's in control. We have so much to be thankful for, and when we are thankful I think that brings about some power in our own personal lives. You know? When, and, and sometimes it takes difficulties and struggles for us to get to a place in our life where we have to completely just depend upon him. You know? That's why I think find it so interesting with the things going on around us. What are we depending upon? You know? I'm not saying God doesn't give us some wisdom. I'm not saying that God doesn't give technology. I'm not saying that God doesn't give us medicines and things like that. I'm not saying that, so don't hear me say that. But what I am saying is that when we get ourselves in spots as a, as a people, as a human race, 
and we think that we have the abilities to fix it, all we do is find ourselves making it worse. But what is it we can trust? We can trust the fact that God is the one that's able to intervene and step up and do when we just simply fall and trust in him. If you go back and read the book of Deuteronomy and you read what God said to the nation of Israel with the blessings and cursing, he said, listen, if you'll just be obedient to me, I will bless you. And you don't have any concerns. You don't have no worries. But now if you don't, then I'm going to bring about some judgments. You know what I think? As individuals, I think as families, I think as churches, I think as communities, I think as countries, I think it's the same thing. It applies the same way today. But we've got so much to be thankful for if we'll just line up with the Lord, with just the Lord, just line up with him. And how powerful that is. You know? You say, well, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, there's a lot going on right now in the world. and I mean, everything is higher and I mean, it's getting all expensive, and it's, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know either. I wish I had all the answers that way, but I know this. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he's going to take care of it. You know? I'll tell you what he don't. He don't watch the NASDAQ. He don't watch the Dow. You know why? He don't need it. <laughs> I mean, he don't need it. You know? I mean, he don't have to sweat all that stuff. He don't care what. Freddie Mac and Nanny Mae or what all them people are. I don't even know. I thought it was, uh, you know, Beverly Hillbillies taking care of stuff. You know what I'm saying? That's about what's going on, look like to me, right? You know? I don't quite understand all that stuff. I don't really care, you know? I think it's pretty crazy, but I know this. I serve a God that owns cattle on a thousand hills. I know I serve a God that said, let there be light, and it just light shows up. God said, hey, let the earth be filled with animals. Let the sea be filled with animals. Let the air be filled with animals. And he just took us dust to earth, filled and formed us up, breathed us, made a living soul. I mean, it's just amazing. He just holds everything together like this. Everybody's crying about, you know, I, where I work, man, they print papers off all day long. I said, man, if you're a tree hugger, you hate working here, you know. But... I think about that. I think about them fires over in California. Man, it killed a lot of trees that's been there for a lot of years. You hear people, all they talk about is climate change. Blows my mind on some of the foolishness that we sit here and worry about. You know? And I remember saying that last church I pastored, some guy in the audience said, oh, so you're a scientist now. <laughs> Lord, give me an opportunity to go talk to him after service, too. I said, never claim to be a scientist, dude, but I know this. I know what the book says. I know exactly what the book says. And there ain't no godless, atheistic, fool of a scientist gonna tell me something that's contrary to the word of God, and you're gonna get me to believe it. So why are we fretting? What are we sweating? What are we worrying about? You know what I'm thankful for? I don't have anything to worry about. In fact, the Bible says for me to worry, it is sin. But God says, I'm going to give you peace that passes all understanding. You just bring your cares to me. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who's able to take care of all those things? And I see Psalm 103, folks, this week, we ought to be thankful, and we ought to let that be known, that I'm thankful this week for the Lord Jesus. I'm thankful for his word. I'm thankful for the truths thereof. I'm thankful for his forgiveness. I'm thankful for my home in heaven. I'm thankful for his presence in the here and now. I'm thankful that he's working all things out for the good of those who love him or called according to his purpose. I'm thankful that judgment's coming for those that have tried to do away with him. And I'm thankful that one day everybody's going to go ahead and confess with their mouth. They're going to bow their knees or they're going to confess with their tongue that he is the Lord. They're, everybody's going to know about it, folks. No questions. Oh, Muhammad, guess what? He's going to get a say. He already knows. He sure knows now. 
and opened his eyes in torment. Not know. He knew. He knows. All these other folks, they know. And they're going, and then everybody's going to eventually know. And I'm also thankful today that God didn't desire for any of them to perish, but he desired for all of them to come to him. And he desires for all people to come today to him. Don't we have hope? Don't we have something to share? Man, what, what an awesome thought. We got much to be thankful for and how that can empower our lives to live a life of fulfillment in an all messed up world. I'm going to ask Brother Jamie if he'll come and those are going to help with the invitation as they make their way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight, thanking you once again for just to be able to look at your truths of your word. Just in this one psalm, that remind us of how much we're to be thankful for. I mean, there's so much there, Lord. I mean, if we never looked at anything else, if we didn't turn another page in the Bible, if we didn't even examine our own lives, if we could just read those truths, and we have enough to be thankful for for now and for all eternity. But, Lord, it's just so much more even than what Psalm 103 has. So I pray, Lord, as you've spoke to our hearts, maybe there's some burdens, maybe there's some struggles, that we need to come and give to you. Maybe we haven't had the, the attitude of thankfulness like we need to. Maybe we need to come and seek forgiveness for that. Your mercy is there. Your grace is there to forgive us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see that being thankful empowers us to live in a world that's a mess because we know you're in control. We know your word will last forever. We know you're sitting on the throne. We know you're coming again. We know you're working presently. We know you have a plan of purpose that you're bringing about and that no man or Satan or anything else is going gonna, is gonna to stop what you're doing and what you're, gonna, what you're bringing about. We know you're still in the saving business, and we're thankful for that. We know still that the wretched person out there is not beyond reach of the cross if they just come to you. They just take heed to the free gift of eternal life as they are convicted of their sin and drawn by your spirit. They would come to you, you would save them. Maybe there's somebody here that needs to be saved. I pray they'd come. Lord, I pray you just work in our hearts. As we have heard you, may we respond to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.